you know, very, very unique, very poor personality, very senior. You're in the movement in 1971. So he's been like 50 years practicing Krishna consciousness. And, um, and we are just so fortunate to have him with us. Um, really, I'm grateful because his contribution to the Maya Principle. So I hope, I'm pretty sure you have a good time, a great time with him. Um, you're coming for two units, and um, yeah, so we're going back a few chapters from the Bhagavatam now. So I'll leave you with him. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, if there is anything that you need in regards to the class, uh, Prabhu Maharaj, which is under the batch of some Maya, Mayapur Institute, he's, he's, he will be the host of the screen. Who? He will be the host of the class. Who? Which person? Okay. Who's the host? He has a Mayapur Institute name and he has his hand up right now with the, with the purple hat. Can, <laughs> can. Okay, all right. Would, Mayapur Institute, yeah. He's also a teacher in the Mayapur Institute. Okay. Rupa Goswami, I think. All right. Okay, so he was he's the host. Yeah. Okay, very okay. good. Thank you, Prabhu. And if you need anything, you can always reach to me and um, I'll be available. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Prabhu. Thank you very much. Okay. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pastaya Bhutale. Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Pracharine Recording in progress Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschacha Desha Tarine Vanchakaupatarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Paivacha Patita Nam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnavi Bhyo Namo Namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nichananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So it seems uh, it's a little bit dis disorientated. You already jumped ahead in the Bhagavatam and you have to go back a bit, right? You began, I think it was uh, Yadunanda and Swami taught the first two chapters. And then who was teaching the Damodar Lila? Garanga Darshan? Yes, Maharaj. Okay. So for some reason they asked me to go back a week. That was not convenient for someone. So I said, okay, yeah, no problem. I hope it's not too much of a disturbance for you in your studies. Anyway, not a big deal really. Okay, so we're beginning chapter 3. This, we have uh, five chapters to cover in this week and we have five days. So we're beginning chapter 3, the birth of Lord Krishna. Nice topic to speak about. Uh, the, so this chapter covers uh, the auspicious nature of the planet with the appearance of Lord Krishna on the planet, how the, how the world rejoices because the Lord is appearing on the planet. And then we're going to hear about the actual birth of the Lord and His appearance. And then we'll hear the prayers offered by Vasudev and Devaki. And we will hear also the Lord reply to them. So that's pretty much what happens in this third chapter. It's not a very heavy chapter really, not really, it's a more pastime, more lila. We're hearing about the birth of the Lord, His appearance. So. The chapter begins, Sukadeva Goswami speaking, of course, to Maharaj Parikshit, and he begins talking about the appearance of the Lord and how everything became very auspicious. 
what what would make the planet auspicious what kind of things happen maybe you could mention one thing for me ramakrishna prabhu ramakrishna prabhu is an old friend of mine we know each other from previous classes he's a wonderful devotee so could you just give me one uh, special feature of the auspicious nature of the planet at the time of Lord Krishna's appearance? As uh, stated in the Bhagavatam, the constellation and the appearance of all the favorable stars was one of the uh, auspicious things that could be understood. Okay. Are you an astrologer yourself? No, Maharaj. I'm just trying to follow. Okay. Anyway, uh, some people are into astrology and they know in detail about the different auspicious planets, what's auspicious and everything. So we're told some detail because Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, he was an, an astrologer. He certainly knew so. And, and it appears also Srila Vyasadeva must have known something also because he's written about it. It's described quite detailed. At the time of the appearance of the Lord, the constellation Rohini, supposed to be a very auspicious constellation, and stars like Ashwini, and then the sun, the moon, they were all in ascension, they were all in very auspicious places. I think it's an interesting topic to look at people you want to understand a person it's an idea you know you can get them to give you the details of their birth you know somebody's claiming to be an incarnation of god <laughs> we can ask them when when were you born can you give me the detail let me see i, I just want to check your chart because it, it should indicate who is actually divine personality we should see certain features in and then the time of their birth, the different auspicious planets should all be in the right place. Just like when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, with the, with, with the appearance of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, there were, it was noted, uh, Nilambar Chakravarti, he, because Sachimata was his daughter, so she was worried she'd been carrying the child for some time the child should have taken birth and she had not delivered but nilambar chakravarti thakur he uh, looked at this, the stars and and he made he said oh he said i think this child is waiting for the auspicious time to take birth and he understood this is an indication that he's a great soul so Nilambar Chakravarti, he was also an astrologer and he knew this and he could see that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was just, he was just waiting for that particular auspicious time which came of course on the, in the month of Falgun, on the Purmi, Purnima and it happened at that particular time there was the eclipse. So it was suspicious because everyone was chanting the holy name. So here we have Lord Krishna and it's described him taking birth. The sun, the moon, other stars and planets were very peaceful. All directions appeared extremely pleasing. Beautiful stars twinkled in the cloudless sky. <laughs> I look at the sky today, here my for full of clouds. <laughs> full of clouds today. Last few days we had a lot of clouds and rain even here. Anyway, at the time of the appearance of Lord Krishna, there was also rain. There was also storm, right? Indra was showering rain. But that was, that was auspicious also. So this is the description, it said that the whole universe was surcharged with the quality of goodness, beauty and peace. When we look at the world today, we cannot imagine, you know, what it must have been like. Goodness, beauty and peace. 
we don't see these things so much today, the Kali Yuga, the influence of Kali Yuga in the modern age. Anyway, 5,000 years ago, the whole universe was influenced because of the auspicious occasion, the appearance of Lord Krishna. Then it mentions, it said, decorated with towns, villages, mines, and pasturing grounds, the earth seemed all auspicious. Now it's interesting, when I read this, I thought towns, okay, villages, okay, but then it said mines. What are they mining? Anyone can tell me? What, what would they be mining? You know, I'm from the UK, and in England, when people mine, they talk about mines, they're thinking about coal. <laughs> but I cannot imagine that the bridge Bassi people that here, and that 5,000 years ago, people were mining coal. What would they be mining? What do people in India mine? Gold, silver, maybe that I don't know. Yeah, could be like that, yeah. Some gold, yeah. Certainly they had the gold rush in USA. They had got, and they found gold in California. There's a gold rush. People were digging up everywhere. So it could be gold. It could be other... What, did, what else did you say, Prabhu? Madhiji, Divya Lila, is it? Who spoke? Who spoke? Gold and what else? What other things you might mine? Precious metals, Maharaj. Yes, I think so. Precious metals, maybe some stones, uh, marble, coral. I don't know. Well, coral is usually in the sea. But anyway, it shows that the people were, you know, they were, they were depending on nature, nature's gifts. So they were not idle people, they were, they were working and they would even do things like mining. Then it's mentioned, the rivers flowed with clear water, the lakes and reservoirs full of lotuses and lilies, extraordinary beautiful, trees and green plants, full of flowers, leaves, pleasing to the eyes. Everything, very nice. It said that even the birds singing for the sake of the demigods. So everything was auspicious. Uh, and the example is given that lotuses, the lotus flower usually will open in the daytime. And as it comes to evening, sunset, they will close. But at the time of Lord Krishna's appearance, the stroke of midnight, when the Lord appeared, the lotuses were open. So what, what was actually night? Because of birds, birds like, well, cuckoos, of course, they would usually, they're usually asleep in the day and they're awake at night. They're birds of the night. And the, but the bees began, the swarms of bees, they're usually daytime creatures. And then it's mentioned, there was a, 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 a pure, breeze was blowing, pleasing to the skin and bearing the aroma of flowers. Now what season was it when Lord Krishna appeared? Which particular season was there? At the time of the birth of Krishna? Autumn. Autumn, right. So autumn. So Jalangi Maharaji will know about autumn, living in Mayapur, right? So what happens in autumn? Is it dry season or wet season? Wet season, still very hot. Yeah, right, yeah. So, the particular time with the appearance of Lord Krishna, the breeze, you know, autumn, do you get much breeze? Not much breeze, right? But here it's described, there was a pleasant breeze blowing pleasing to the sense of touch and carrying the aroma of flowers, flowers which usually bloom in spring. Now, you said autumn, so spring was gone, but still, because Lord Krishna was appearing, there was 
the, 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 the blooming of special flowers from spring and the aroma of these flowers from spring. So in this way everything was so nice. And they're all just waiting for the birth of the Supreme Lord. It said, even the, the, the saints and the brahmanas, that they were, they were always disturbed because they're living in the kingdom of Kamsa. So when they have such a demonic ruler, it's, very, it's, a, it's a great disturbance, you know, when you live in a country which is demoniac, when the, when the rulers, when the governments are all demoniac, you're always threatened. You never know when you're going to be persecuted. We even saw Srivas Thakur living in Mayapur. He was always worried that the Muslim government, the army, are going, the, the soldiers are all going to come and arrest him because of their kirtan. The smarter brahmanas were always telling him like that. We're going to report you to the Kazi. The Kazi's men are going to come and arrest you. So Srivas was always a little afraid that the Kazi's men were coming. So when you have demonic rulers like that, you live in fear. But it's described here that these saints and brahmanas who were usually disturbed, they actually felt very blissful within the core of their hearts. Somehow they just could understand that this is a very, this is a very good time. Something is, something is taking place which is very auspicious. We see also at the time of the appearance of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Advaita Acharya, Haridas Thakur, they were both doing kirtan and dancing and ecstasy. Now they didn't know the Lord was coming, but somehow from the heart they could perceive something very auspicious was taking place. And then we're told kettle, kettle drums were sounding from the upper planetary systems. So like this, we're given some information about the appearance of Lord Krishna, the time when he's going to come. Everything certainly very nice. Sometimes people ask, they would ask sometimes, uh, I remember them asking Tamal Krishna Maharaj, they would ask about this one South Indian person, is he actually God? Because they were all, you know, there was so much talk that this person is very powerful, we think he's God. So I remember some people asking Tamal Krishna Maharaj, is this person God? And he said, well, he said, look at the earth planet and look at India, it, it just, it's just not very prosperous. The whole planet is economically unstable. It's not, it doesn't indicate that this person could be an incarnation of God. If he was God, there would be prosperity in the world. There would be no poverty. And the cows would be properly taken care of. There would be no slaughtering of cows. When all of these inauspicious things go on, then you have to expect problems. There will be trouble. And we can see troubles, of course, at this, at this particular time, so many troubles. But still, the world is going on, everything is going on under the control of Krishna. The devotee for the devotees, they always remain transcendental, undisturbed. Sometimes heat, sometimes cold, sometimes hardship, sometimes success. We just simply have to depend on Krishna and see what is Lord Krishna's arrangement. So with the appearance of Lord Krishna, Lord Krishna was born and of course, Janmashtami comes, as Jalangi Maharaji said, in autumn. So it's somewhere like September. But still, it, it was like, like spring. It wasn't cold. Everything was nice. 
just like just like in Sarat, right? The Sarat season. Sarat season. We had we just had Sarat a little. The beginning of Kartik is Sarat. Sarat means not very hot, just comfortable. It's the moon is beautiful, very cooling. So like this, the Sarat season. It was like that when Lord Krishna appeared, although it was actually autumn. So this is the, how the chapter begins. And then we hear also about the residents of the higher planets, how they're responding, how they're behaving. The Kanaras, the Gandharvas, the Charanas, the Apsaras, they're all doing their different activities. Apsaras are dancing, the, the Gandharvas, they are also singing auspicious songs. And the charanas are offering prayers, different activities for these different demigods. The demigods also, that they, we know that previously you studied in the second chapter how the demigods were coming regularly to Mother Devaki to offer prayers to the Supreme Lord while he was in the womb of Devaki. So the demigods, they had some knowledge about the Lord coming in this world. And then we read in Srimad Bhagavatam, text 7 and 8, how demigods and saintly persons were sh showering flowers, a joyous mood. The clouds gathered in the sky, thundering. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, who was situated in the, in the core of everyone's heart, appeared from the heart of Devaki in the dense darkness of night, like the full moon rising on the eastern horizon. There's some interesting points in this verse because the demigods address, uh, rather, the, the Supreme Lord, he is addressed by the name Janardhan. They use the name Janardhan to address the Lord. And the Acharyas point out, they say, this is, this Jana refers to the people who are making the address. And Udana, Urdana, this is, the, they're making the request. So the people are making a request. Who are these people? These people are the Munis and the Devas. And what is their request? They are saying, O oh Lord, it is time for you to take birth now. <laughs> Very wonderful. Could you imagine the demigods coming to the, 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 the lady? She's carrying a child. And the demigods say, O oh Lord, it is time for you to take your birth now. So this is the significance of addressing the Lord as Janardana. And it's mentioned also about the full moon. So, who would like to explain to us about the moon being full? Who hasn't had a chance to speak yet? Yeah? Someone can tell us why, what, how the moon was full? Because we know Krishna, Krishna's birth is on the eighth day. So is the moon full after eight days? Who can explain this to us? Hare Krishna Prabhuji. Yes, Maharaji, please. Uh, Prabhuji, it is written here, the moon uh, was in an overjoyous condition. So by the grace of Krishna, he could appear as a full moon to welcome the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The vanning moon became a full moon in jubilation. Yes. But why? You didn't, you didn't tell us the exact reason, the specific reason why the moon was full. You have not read the purport? <laughs> yes, Prabhu? Because Lord Krishna appeared in the moon, then I know you know why. 
<laughs> I don't want to ask you. I know you know <laughs> you're very well read. I wanted to hear some people who haven't had a chance to speak yet. Please. Yes, there was a brahmachari going to speak. Who was that? The brahmachari. Yes, uh, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna Prabhu. What's your name? I'm from Ramskandar Nasa. Okay, where are you from? Calcutta. Oh, okay. okay, from Calcutta. Okay, good. So, why was the moon full? Lord Ram appeared in Skoro dynasty, but uh, Krishna has now appeared in Luna dynasty. So, that's why moon was very happy and uh, he became full, yeah. full of happiness. That's right. Yes, right. The moon. The Lord is taking birth in which dynasty? Lunar dynasty. The lunar dynasty. And who's in which particular dynasty does Lord Krishna appear? What's the name of the king? Okay. Yaduku. Right. Yadu. The Yadu dynasty. Right. Yes. Good. Okay. So that's right. So the moon was in the joyous condition, very pleased, because the Lord is coming, right? There's the, the Kshatriya kings have these two dynasties, one's from the sun, the other from the moon. So Lord Rama came in the solar, the, the dynasty from the sun. Okay, and then Prabhupada gives extensive, extensive purport on this verse. And he, he talks about Grandfather Bhishma. Grandfather Bhishma, one of the twelve Mahajans. And Grandfather Bhishma says, the personality of Godhead is situated in the core of everyone's heart, just as the sun may be on everyone's head. Yet, although the sun may be on the heads of millions of… this, this does not mean that the sun is variously situated. Similarly, because the Personality of Godhead has inconceivable potencies, He can be within, everyone, within everyone's heart and yet not be situated variously. It's unusual English language, you know, I, I'm not so familiar how Prabhupada uses the word variously here. But anyway, the point is taken that the Lord is within everyone's heart and Lord Krishna doesn't have to be only in the, in the hearts of everyone, but he has his own free will. So Prabhupada quotes the Ishopanishad, verse number 7, Ekatvam, Ekatvam Anupashyataha. Right? Who knows the meaning, Ekatvam Anupashyataha? Right? You all studied Bhakti Shastri long time ago. So, Ekatvam Anupashyataha uh, means that uh, there is unity in the purpose between Jiva and the Supreme Lord. Okay. Ekatvam, oneness, right? And Anupashyataha yes. meaning? We, we see this. Uh, in the in the line of the acharyas yes. this one the, right. the unity is understood in the line of the vaishnava acharyas yes very good that's right yes we must see things through the line of the authorities and the vision of the saintly persons so Prabhupada explains the lord is one but he can appear in everyone's heart by his inconceivable potency <coughs> Uh, throughout, throughout the Srimad Bhagavatam, as well as Bhagavad Gita, it comes up again and again. We have to appreciate the inconceivable potency of the Lord. Uh, we see, for example, how the first avatars of the Lord are forms like Kurma and Machya and Varaha, and they're indicating the inconceivable potencies of the Lord. It's very important because when we come to the tenth canto, and we're going to, we're going to be hearing about the lila of Lord Krishna, so it's important for us to understand the transcendental nature 
of Lord Krishna and not to see them in an ordinary way. We know there are people who want to, uh, they want to imitate Lord Krishna, they want to do like Krishna, they, they think Krishna danced Rasa Leela, I will also dance Rasa Leela. You know, this idea that they want to themselves, they want themselves to become God. But the Srimad Bhagavatam goes to great extents, great efforts to bring out the inconceivable nature of the Lord by very systematically describing the Lord's different incarnations, beginning with such forms as Varaha, Matsya Kurma, Nasringadev, and then gradually coming to the human form and then coming to Lord Krishna. And then when we talk about Lord Krishna's pastimes, then Lord Krishna, we hear about the Bala Leela. We hear about Krishna defeating the different demons coming. Important point that we want to understand the inconceivable potency. That the Lord was within the heart of Devaki and he appears as her child. Now, how did the Lord get into her heart? We have to understand that carefully. Some, we may think, oh, seminal impregna impregnation. No, not at all. How did the Lord enter into the womb of Devaki? Prabhupada makes the point, he said, she's always there. She, she's there. She's everywhere. So she's also in the womb of Devaki. He's, he is also in the womb of Devaki. So the Lord can also appear from the womb of Devaki as he likes. That's his inconceivable potency. If he can be within the atom, he can be within everything, then he can also be within the womb of Devaki. And by his inconceivable potency, he can also take birth from the womb of Devaki. <laughs> and Prabhupada writes in the purport, he is situated in Mathura, in Vaikuntha, and in the core of the heart. Therefore, one should clearly understand that he did not live like an ordinary child in the heart or the womb of Devaki, nor did he appear like an ordinary human child, although he seemed to do so in order to bewilder Asuras like Kamsa. What was the month of pregnancy when Devaki delivered? How long had she been pregnant? Mataji should know this, right? Mataji, have, have you delivered children before? You have any children? How many months pregnancy do you usually undergo before you deliver a child? Radha, Ra, Ramakrishna Prabhu, can you help them out? <laughs> Do you have children? Yes, yes, Maharaj. How how much how long is the pregnancy usually? Usually it should be nine months. Right, it should be nine months. So when did Krishna take birth? How long did he wait before he took birth? He came earlier. Huh? He did not wait. He came earlier, he did not wait. Right, he came earlier, right? He came eight months, in the eighth month of pregnancy, he appeared, right? Why? There's a purpose. Why did he do that? Yes? Why he came early? Jalangi, do you know? Hi, Krishna Guru Maharaj. I don't know why he appeared early, but the calculation is Devaki, first she had a child, and then that child is transformed to uh, Rohini's womb. That is like seven months. And then the birth date between Krishna and Balarama is like two weeks. So it's like seven months, two weeks time. That is that much time for Krishna's pregnancy. But I don't know why he appeared early. It must be for his pastime. 
Yeah, well, the Acharya is tell us, Prabhu, you know? I'm spot the builder concern. So, sorry? The no, builder no, concern. Yes, right. That's uh, right, yes. Your voice is not very clear, but I, I could hear, yeah. To, be, to bewilder Kamsa, yes, because that's why he came early, because Kamsa is waiting. He's already killed the other children, the first six. The seventh was Lord Balaram, so that was a, the, he had, the, they thought that Devaki had had a miscarriage, but actually Lord Balaram was transferred to the womb of Rohini. And the eighth child, who was the one who was supposed to kill Kamsa, Kamsa was the most anxious to get that child. And so Lord Krishna came early. <laughs> he played a, a trick. If he'd come late, Kamsa would have been waiting, waiting, anxious. But Lord Krishna came early. He didn't, Kamsa didn't expect the child to come before nine months. This is Lord Krishna's trick. Lord Krishna is the supreme tricker, <laughs> great trickster. And so he came early and of course we're going to hear about how he appears, the, the, what is his specific features, right? Text 9 and 10 we'll hear about the particular features of the Lord at the time of his birth. So, uh, Vasudev saw the newborn child, very wonderful, lotus-like eyes. Actually, different parts of the body of the Lord are like lotus, right? In the nectar of devotion, we read different parts of the body are like lotus. He had lotus eyes, he has a lotus face, he has, he has also lotus feet, he has lotus hands, he has a lotus navel. And there's that wonderful verse, Queen Kunti said, Namo Pankajanabhaya, Namo Pankajan Malane, Namo Pankajanitraya, Namaste Pankajangraye. Right. The Lord, he, he, not only is he lotus-like, but he has a, a lotus garland around his neck and his glance is as cooling as lotus flowers. So lotus is very dear to Lord Krishna. It's a very beautiful flower and that's why we like to use them for the deities. So the Lord comes, his lotus eyes, and he has also, of course, he has four-handed form, and he's carrying the four symbols of Lord Vishnu. But there are other features, particular features which identify him. If, you read, if you've read the Brihad Bhagavatamrita, you can read about Gopkumar going into Vaikuntha. And there were many people with four arms. Everyone he met had four arms, and he was thinking they were, they were the Lord. But they would say, no, 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 I'm not the Lord, no, no, no. But they all had four arms. So that's one of the liberation, types of liberation, to get Swarupya Mukti, a form like the Lord. In Vaikuntha, many, the, the inhabitants, they have that form. But there are special features which identify the Supreme Lord from the other devotees, right? What are those features? Srivatsa. Yes. Uh, what is Srivatsa? What is it actually? Srivatsa mark on the chest, which is as Amnamakmaran Lakshmi. Okay. Yeah, the mark on the chest. Right then. And, and is there another feature also? There's a special... Kostubamani. Kostubamani, right. Kostuba. The Kastuba gem. Only the Supreme Personality of Godhead has that Kastuba gem, right. So that's there. And so those are identifying features of the Lord. And of course he, he's dressed, the, the Lord is usually dressed in yellow. His body's blackish. And it's mentioned his hair is fully grown. So it's always interesting when you see children born, you know, some of them, many of them come out no hair. 
And some of them, they come with a little hair. But here, you see the Lord's come, he's got a full head of hair. <laughs> Very lucky. You know, full head of, you know, nice black hair. And then also, he's decorated with a helmet. And the helmet is decorated with special stones, Vaidurya gems, Vaidurya gems which change color, yellow, red and blue. It's a very, very special ornaments. So the Lord is all decorated with these ornaments and he's got his weapons also. What's a particular weapon the Lord carries? It will be he has, he has the Sudarshan Chakra and then also the club and the Gada. So those are the weapons of the Lord. So he's come fully decorated, everything very wonderful. So seeing the Lord in this way, very pleasing to the eye. Blackish color. Blackish means like the rain cloud. And Chatur Bhujam with the four arms. If you had a child, you know, if your wife gave birth to a child with four arms, you know, what would you do? Oh no. Oh. Yeah. Quick, cut some arms off. But sometimes, you know, these things happen. Anyway, it's very uncommon. A child would be born, fully grown hair, forearm form, and decorated with ornaments and everything. So the Lord has come in this wonderful form, and He wants to. Why did He choose to? Why did He choose to come in this form? Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. Because he wanted to assure Vasudev, because he was meditating upon the form of the Lord in uh, in that particular form, and he wanted to assure that the son born out of him is the supreme personality of God. Right. Yes. Yes. He wants them to know, both Vasudev and Devaki, that they should know that he is the Lord Himself, that he has come. And he's come for their pleasure. So Vasudev saw this uh, wonderful son, and naturally <laughs> he's very happy. Father is very happy to see he's got a wonderful son, and he wants to give charity. It's customary, not so customary these days, <laughs> but in the past it used to be customary. When a, a father's, when a father would be blessed with a child, the father would want to give charity. And we read how Vasudev, he also wants to give charity, but he has a problem, right? He, what's the problem? How to give charity? What's his problem? He wants to give charity. Huh? He's in the prison. Yes, right. He's in the prison. How can he give charity when he's in the prison? Mm. So, what does he do? Mentally he, he does it. Do you do any of your offerings mentally? Some people, you know, some devotees, they have deities or may have shilas and like that, and they may do the man manasa puja. They do the puja in their mind. And sometimes, sometimes we're in a situation, you know, you want to offer flowers to Prabhupada, and there's no flowers. What do you do? You can do it in, in your mind. Within our mind we can offer something. So, offering to Krishna from the mind. Of course, if we can actually get the things, it's better. But if we don't, we have nothing, then within the mind we can do it. And that's certainly pleasing. The Lord can be worshipped in the mind. So Vasudev, he 
wants to give charity in, in those days, the Vedic culture, they will give cows. How many cows did Vasudev give in the mind? Ten thousand. Ten thousand, right. How many does Nanda Maharaj give when, when Krishna comes as his child? Do you know that? Have you read that yet? Nanda Maharaj. He gave, I think it's two million. Twenty lakh. So, anyway, uh, many cows. Ten thousand cows. Oh, if you have fifty cows, we think, oh, so many cows. Here, Vasudev. Vasudev gave in his mind. Actually, Vasudev had many cows, but Kamsa had taken all of his cows. Later on, when we read through the tenth canto, we'll hear when Vasudev is released from prison. One of the first things he does after the death of Kamsa and Vasudev is brought out of the prison, then he gets the cows which were taken by Kamsa and he gives them in charity. So he kept his word. It's not that he was miserly. Sometimes, you know, we think, I'll just give charity in my mind. <laughs> and we don't actually go in our pocket, we don't go into our wallet, we don't go into the bank account to give charity. We just want to do it in the mind. But Vasudev was not like that. As soon as he got out of prison and got his cows back, he gave 10,000 cows in charity to the Brahmanas. I thought that was an interesting point to note. And, and Prabhupada, well, Srimad Bhagavatam says, distributed them among the Brahmanas as a transcendental festival. Very nice. We all like festivals. That's a nice festival to give away a lot of cows in charity. So we want to speak about the wonder. What wonder did Vasudev have upon seeing his child? Why was he filled with wonder? Why was it so like astonishing? His eyes were struck with wonder when he saw his extraordinary son. It was extraordinary, it was wonderful, because one of the reasons was that he's in the prison house and the Lord is coming as his son. So this, that is in itself is just amazing, that you're in the prison of this demon, you know, and you're in chains and you're there in the cell and the Lord is coming as your child. That is so wonderful. So that was one thing which was wonderful to him. Another thing which was wonderful was that he come from the womb of Devaki. Although he's the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he'd come from the womb of a human being. So that was, that was just amazing. It was astounding to Vasudev that the Lord was doing all of these wonderful things. And it was also wonderful to Vasudev that the Lord was coming as his son, almost like a child taking shelter of the father. Although the Lord, the Supreme Lord, is never fearful of anything, in fact, fear personified is afraid of him, but the Lord is coming as the child of Vasudev. The Vasudev will be like his father and protect him. So these things are mentioned in the purport. If you go through the purport, text number 11. Uh, yeah, the, I mentioned uh, three of them. The fourth, <coughs> the Supreme Personality of Godhead was Vasudev's worshipable deity, yet he had taken birth as his son. So Vasudev was a, he was a devotee of the Supreme Lord, of course. The Lord is coming in his, as his child. The Lord doesn't come 
in just any family, but he will come in the family of his great devotees. So Prabhupada speaks about the importance of serving the Lord, and if you can't do it physically, we can do it mentally, and we should do it. It's a great mental exercise. We read in the Nectar of Devotion wonderful example about the Brahmana cooking his sweet rice. Of course he served the deities for a long time mentally. And then finally one day the Lord took him back to Godhead. Okay, going ahead. Uh, so Vasudev is going to begin his prayers to the Personality of Godhead. That's text number 13. You are the Supreme Person beyond material existence. You are the Super Soul. Your form can be perceived by transcendental knowledge by which you can be understood as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. I now understand your position perfectly. This is very nice. Vasudev is, ex is, ex Vasudev is expressing his realization of the Lord. He says, I now understand your position perfectly. We have to know about the identity of the Lord, the, pos the position of the Lord. That is important in devotional service. We cannot just think, I'm a devotee and we don't know anything. We have to know about the Lord and His feet, His qualifications and His pastimes. So Vasudev has awakened this kind of realization. And naturally Vasudev will be worried that Kamsa will be coming to kill him. But at the same time, Vasudev also knows that this is not an ordinary child, that this is the personality of Godhead. So Vasudev, he has this, on one side he's my son, and on the other side he's God. And this is how the Lord also tells Vasudev and Devaki how they should think of him. That the Lord tells them that you should think of me as your child and at the same time always remember that I am the personality of Godhead. So we see the devotion of Vasudev and Devaki is different from Nanda Maharaj and Mother Yashoda because that it is a different mood. Although they're both Nichasiddhas, both Devaki and Yashoda Mata, they're both Nichasiddhas, but their moods are different. So Lord Krishna has appeared as the child of Vasudev and Devaki, and Vasudev is offering his prayers first, and then we'll hear Mother Devaki also offer her prayers. Mother Yashoda and Nanda Maharaj, they don't offer prayers to Krishna when he comes as their child. When Mother Yashoda delivers a child, she's not going to offer prayers. But Vasudev and Devaki, they, they will offer prayers because they have the the different rasa, the different mood. We have to appreciate this situation. So Vasudev continues his glorification of the Lord. Text 14, My Lord, you are the same person who in the beginning created this material world by his personal external energy. 
So Vasudeva knows that before the creation, the Lord existed. And then he said, after the creation of the world, the three gunas, you appeared to have entered it, although in fact you have not. Actually, the Lord did enter it. Vasudeva can see the Lord in front of him. And at the same time, he knows the Lord is also outside of the whole creation. So the Lord is both within and without of this cosmic manifestation. This is appreciated by Vasudeva. And of, the Lord is never under the influence of the material energy, because he himself is the controller of the material energy. So Prabhupada quotes different scriptures, he quotes Brahma Samhita a lot, referring to the Lord's incarnations, how he comes. It's Antaryami, the super soul, how he enters this material world, how he's within the atoms, and at the same time, he's also Mahavishnu, lying in the causal ocean and the universes are all coming from his body. So some people will limit Lord Krishna. They will think that when Krishna comes, just like I remember one time I was doing Sankirtan in Europe, and I met this one young man, and he said to me, I know Krishna cannot be God, because Krishna takes birth. And then he said to me, Shiva is God. Shiva is light. So, how do you deal with someone like that? Would anybody like to argue against that? Have you got some explanation? He said, I know Krishna cannot be God. He took birth. What will we say? Did the Lord take birth? Uh, Maharaj, can I just try? Okay, please, yes. Uh, we can talk, uh, quote him from the Bhagavad Gita. Which verse? Where, uh, where Krishna says that uh, uh, his birth and activities are uh, uh, transcendental and one who understands that uh, does not take birth again. So we could quote from that verse and then uh, he also says there's no, no truth uh, beyond him and also he says he's unborn, eternal. Okay. What if the person said, I don't accept Bhagavad Gita? You're quoting the Bhagavad Gita, but the person may be a jnani or a Vedantist. He says, I don't accept Bhagavad Gita. That's your Bhagavad Gita. I don't, I don't accept Bhagavad Gita. We can say, we don't need to announce it, let's What? That is true. We can quote, we don't need to announce it, let's check it out. Eko Bhagavad Gita, that is true. Yeah, you can quote that, but where's the Lord Krishna come in? May I try, Maharaj? Yes, Prabhu. Uh, the Lord can everything. Why can't He uh, take birth? Is it simple logic? Say, say it again, it's not so clear. Uh, the Lord can do anything. Therefore, he can take birth. Why not? He's not limited for that. Okay, yeah, you could say like that, yeah. He has inconceivable potencies, right? We were speaking about inconceivable potencies. This is a problem with many people, you see. They, they don't begin in the proper place. They try to understand God, but they have not understood the basic things. They have not understood the first thing. First thing is that God has inconceivable potencies. 
that there are such things as in, in achincha shaktis. Right? What are some examples? Achincha shakti. Divya Leela Devi Dasi. Can you give some examples? Achincha shakti. He can walk and doesn't walk. Uh, Ishwapanishad says that he can walk and doesn't walk at the same time, Maharaj, that he is far and he is nearby as well. Okay, yes, all right. Yeah, that's Shruti. That's Shruti. Ishwapanishad. Upanishads, yeah. But the, even the Gyanis, they have to accept that. But but they can deny, the. they can say this is not Krishna, this is the... This is something, Brahman. the Brahman, right? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Upanishad says, Brahmanyo Devaki Putraha. Upanishad also says, Brahmanyo Devaki Putraha. Ah, okay. Brahmanyo Devaki Putraha. Yeah, that's a good quote to give them. And generally, we, we speak about logic, you know. And first of all, we, they have to understand about Achincha Shakti, that there is an inconceivable potency. We give the example, the sun. So much heat and light every day, burning so much energy every day, never exhausted, burning constantly. How long, how long the sun has been there? How much heat and light is coming from the sun every day? Inconceivable. And this is Achincha Shakti. Where is this Achincha Shakti? Whose Shakti is it? It's coming from the Supreme Lord. There are so many examples of Achincha Shakti, how the planets are all floating in space, Who's holding the planets in space? Who's keeping them in orbit? There's a Supreme Lord holding everything in space. So we have to understand these things. We want to convince people there is God. And if He wants to take birth, He can do it. He can do anything He wants. If He wants to take birth, He can also come and He can take the form of a small child. But he's never an ordinary child, although he appears like an ordinary child, but he's never ordinary. As we just described, like right? when, he, when he took birth, he appeared full head of hair and fully ornamented, carrying his different or weapons as well, and very attractive, very pleasing. So everything is there to help us to understand the nature of the Lord. And he, he comes out of the womb of Devaki, but he didn't get in the womb of Devaki just simply by karma. The Lord selects his own parents. We were forced, we take birth in a family not by our own choice, but according to our karma. We're placed in the womb of a particular woman, we take birth in a particular society, in a particular family. But the Supreme Lord, when He appears, He will choose exactly where He's going to come and when He's going to come. He's fully in control. We are controlled, but He is the controller. He's the ultimate controller. So this is seen fully in the pastimes of Lord Krishna. And somebody says Shiva is God, but Shiva is just energy. Where does that energy come from? You say, God is light, Shiva is light. Where does the light come from? And then we can quote Upanishads also, you have to go through the light, to come to the source of light. So the source of light is the Supreme Lord. Okay, so that we want to understand the Lord properly. And you know, in order to understand the Lord properly, we have to approach the spiritual master, we have to hear from the proper persons. So it mentions in this purport of this particular verse that Vasudev was in full knowledge of how the Supreme Lord appears and disappears. He was therefore Tattvadashi, a seer of the truth. He personally saw the Supreme Absolute Truth appearing as his son. So he was not in ignorance. He didn't think, oh, God is now my son. 
I must be, I must be greater than God. He didn't think God is limited. He understood the transcendental nature of the Supreme Lord. Sometimes people tell me that they see God. I say, did you offer prayers? If the Lord appears, you have to offer prayers. I say, did you offer obeisances? <laughs> you know, I was in one couple's house one time, and the, the daughter came and said, my mother said she just saw Krishna. I said, oh really? I said, did she bow down? Did she offer obeisances? Did she offer prayers? She said, no. I said, oh, that's not very good, is it? <laughs> so here we see in the scriptures, we see how Vasudeva and Devaki, how they behave, how they receive the Supreme Lord. They, of course, they offered their respects, they give charity, and now they're offering prayers also. And uh, there's a nice example here, that there's a, an analogy given in texts, uh, this is text 15, 16, 17, they're put together, relating the example, that how the Lord cannot be perceived by the senses, it cannot be experienced by the mind or words. With our senses, we can perceive some things, but not everything. Prabhupada says, we can use our eyes to see, but not to taste. You're beyond, but the Lord is beyond the senses. We have to purify ourselves in order to properly understand the Lord. So Vasudeva is offering this very uh, deep prayer here. He talks, in the, he talks about the Mahatattva, how the total energy is undivided, but it appears to separate into the different elements, earth, water, fire, air, and ether. So the, the elements are there, and after the elements are created, the Mahatattva is still there. It's not that there's no more Mahatattva once the elements are created. The Mahatattva will still be there, and the different elements are there. And the, the living energy, separated energies, combine to make the cosmic manifestation visible, the different energies. We heard about the heat and light, fire, these things, they can all combine, air, ether, they all use to combine to make the different cosmic manifestation visible. But before the creation of the world, that energy was already present. Actually, we didn't create anything, it was already there. So the world comes into existence, but it was already there. We are thinking the world is coming into existence, but everything was already there before. The total material energy never actually enters the creation. So this, in this way Vasudeva then compares this to the Supreme Lord, that you, we perceive you by our senses because you're present, right? We can see the Lord. He's here in front of us, so Vasudeva could see him. He's speaking to him. But then he said, the Lord cannot be perceived by the senses, nor experienced by the mind or words. So in one sense you can see him, but in another, another sense you can't. We can see the, we can see the Lord with, with some of our senses, we can experience him, but with others we're not able to experience him. Although you're in touch with the modes of nature, you're not affected by them. You're in everything. You're all-pervading. You're the super-soul. 
So for the Supreme Lord, there's no question of external or internal. You never entered the womb of Devaki, you were already there. So you didn't have to enter. And so Prabhupada relates this to the Bhagavad Gita, how in the Bhagavad Gita Krishna describes similar situation in the ninth chapter. By me in my unmanifested form, this entire universe is pervaded. All beings are in me, but I am not in them. Behold my mystic opulence. Like that. That's the ninth chapter, fourth verse. So Krishna appears in the world, but it's not that we can act, not that everyone can understand him. We have to engage in devotional service in order to understand the Lord. So that is the real purpose, to take up devotional service. So Vasudeva is arguing that the, the whole cosmic manifestation is under the control of the Supreme Lord. Although the Lord has just appeared to him like his child, actually he understands the Lord is the cause of the whole cosmic manifestation. So he appears in the womb of Devaki and he, it appears to have entered, but no, you, you were already there because you're all pervading, you're everywhere, you didn't need to enter. It appears like the Lord is under the modes of nature, but the modes of nature cannot cover him. He is the controller of the material nature. You're never covered by the material nature. We are covered, we get covered by the material energy, but when the Supreme Lord comes, he's always aloof from the material energy. So then Vasudev talks about the conditioned soul, how one thinks of oneself as a body, which is a product of the modes of nature. We think we're independent of the soul. So he describes such people as rascals. And they have not understood the proper conclusion. They have no basis for such conclusion. The body and senses have no, have no substance, no basis. So this conclusion is rejected. A foolish person will never accept that kind of conclusion. The body without a soul, impossible. How you can have a th these two things go together. This is discussed extensively in the third canto of Lord Kapila's teaching that the soul and the body they're always together. You need this you need the soul to have the body, to have life in the body. Without the soul, there's no life in the body. And the soul needs the body. The soul also needs the body. When we go to the spiritual world also, we have a spiritual body. In the material world, we take a material body, but the soul needs a body. And it's about the, the body which has a relationship with Krishna, just as the soul does, because the body is also the energy of Krishna. We cannot say the body is false. No, it's real. And so it also has a relationship with Krishna. But, of course, people, materialistic people, they think the body is just for their sense enjoyment. So you've got the karmis who want to enjoy the body, and the jnanis, they want to reject the world, 
they want to enjoy. What do they want to enjoy? What do the jnanis enjoy? Practically, they don't get any real enjoyment. The tiny little bit of happiness, the jnanis, they give up the material world. They reject everything material. But they don't have anything spiritual really to hold on to. Just simply that oneness which they think about. So two, two kinds of philosophies which are both wrong. The materialistic karmi and the speculative monist. Neither are appreciated by Lord Krishna. So then Vasudev speaks about Vedic scholars. Excuse me, Maharaj. Yes. Please forgive me for interruption. If you wish, earlier teachers have given a break for 10 minutes approximately at this time. Oh, okay. You want to have a break? You can have a break? Okay. 10 minutes. As you wish, Maharaj. Okay, usually I would give class for two hours, but this is a longer class, right? You're going for two and a half hours. Okay, so take a break. Ten minutes. I'll see you back here. Okay. So... Yeah, go ahead. Recording stopped.
Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Prabhu. You're in this class? It was not working. I was connected with other mobile. Oh. <laughs> Where are you? I'm in uh, Jharkhand. Got Jharkhand? Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm in a new center, preaching center. A new preaching center there, huh? Jai. Oh, very nice. Got a lot of people coming there? Yes, Maharaj. You got some land? You got our own, yes, land. Got our yes, own, own land there? Yeah? Yes, Maharaj. Wow, good. Recently we got two acre land. Donated? Yes, Maharaj. Oh, okay. Any property on it? Yeah, property owner. But are the tenants on it also? Pardon, ma'am? Are the people living on the land? No, 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 no. We are. We are living. <laughs> okay. They gave their everything to you, huh? Yeah. If paperwork is not done, but they have given the land. Okay. Within maybe one month, process will be finished. Okay. So you got a lot of people coming there? Yeah, around 200 people come weekly. Oh. And we do also uh, host programs. Nice. You get support okay? Yes, Maharaj. How many devotees with you? Uh, four. Okay. Okay, can we begin now? Yeah? Okay, so we're talking about Vasudev's prayers. And so, just to jump over a few... Recording in progress. Just to jump over a few of his prayers, we come to uh, text number 21, where Vasudev's telling Lord Krishna that I know you're going to kill all the armies that are under the leadership of all these demonic leaders. I know that you've come in the world for this purpose, to kill, to, to purify the planet, get rid of all these demons. So somebody may say, what about Kamsa? Maybe, you know, because Lord Krishna is all attractive. So won't Kamsa be attracted by the sweetness of Lord Krishna? You know, Lord Krishna is all attractive, right? So won't he attract Kamsa? Won't Kamsa be attracted and become a devotee? What do you, what do you say? What do you say, Prabhu? Can Kamsa become a devotee? Kamsa was already attracted by fear. Huh? He's attracted by fear. If Lord wants, it is possible, but Lord wants to uh, do the, what is it called, Viryaras Aswadhan. Viryaras Aswadhan. Ah, Viryaras, yeah. Yeah, question of rasa is there, right? Ra Kamsa doesn't have that ras to be attracted by the sweetness of Krishna. His nature is different. So he's not going to become devotee. Even though Krishna is so sweet, that's <laughs> in the purport there, text number twenty-one, Prabhupada writes about our movement. How our movement is also an incarnation of Krishna in the form of the holy name. And Prabhupada talks about also how our movement that, that we we get sometimes trouble from the different demonic governments. Just like Prahlad Maharaj got harassed by his father, Prabhupada said also sometimes people harass the Hare Krishna movement. Prabhupada writes, it's very difficult to press forward Hare Krishna movement 
But because Krishna has come in the holy name, then this move, through this movement, all these asura, all these asuras will be annihilated and Krishna consciousness will be established all over the world. So, of course, Prabhupada knew all the obstacles, the different people, Kamsa-like people, how they oppose our movement. So Kamsa, uh, Vasudev is worried. He says, as soon as Kamsa hears that you've taken birth, then he's going to come with his lieutenants and they want to kill the, they want to kill you. They'll come with weapons. And they want to kill you. They, because they know, and this is why we are here in Kamsa's prison, because they know that the eighth child is going to be born. So they want to kill you. They're waiting for your birth so they can kill you. And Prabhupada talks there about our Krishna consciousness movement, how so many people try to oppose our movement. And he talks about Bombay. He said even in Mumbai they were opposing. They said Sankirtan is just a nuisance, just disturbing everybody. We don't need this chanting Hare Krishna. They were talking like that. So when Prabhupada heard that, Prabhupada said, send more devotees. He said, do more kirtan. Prabhupada never wanted to stop. So Prabhupada was confident, wherever there is Krishna and Arjuna, there will be victory. So Prabhupada encouraged the devotees, go on, despite the obstacles. Don't worry. So like this Kamsa, Vasudev was also worried about Kamsa. And then Devaki is also there and she's also very much afraid of Kamsa. Then she tells the Lord, he said, he said, I'm very worried, you know, I am, I'm worried, I'm your mother. You've come as my child and I'm your devotee. But at the same time, I'm, I'm afraid. I know you're the Lord, but at the same time, I'm afraid. I'm afraid that you may be, that you may be killed by Kamsa. So Deva, Devaki had this fear. So is, is that fear, is that ignorance? Is that Maya of Devaki? Yeah? What do you say? Yogamaya. Yes, Prabhu, what do you say? It is influence of yoga maya potency. Yoga maya potency, yeah. yeah. Devaki is not in maya, right? Yes? What what particular potency? It's yoga maya, yeah. Actually, it's due to Devaki's prema, because she has prem. So she's feeling that concern for the Lord, that he may be killed, that I'm, we may be killed, he may be killed, he may be harmed. It's not ignorance, it is due to her praying because she has so much deep love for the Lord. So she's feeling like that. So this, it's very special, the, the mood of Mother Devaki, how she so much concerned for her son. Vasu, Vasudev and Devaki, they are Krishna's mother and father. Always. We would, in Brihad Bhagavatam Rita, we read, and in, in, uh, you go into Vaikuntha, the Lord is there. Vasudev and Devaki are also there. And go to Goloka, they're also there in Goloka as well. They're also there. But they have their mood. They have their particular mood, which is different from Nanda and Yashoda. So Lord Krishna enjoys being with his devotees and he hears the prayers of, after hearing the prayers of Vasudeva, he hears Mother Devaki speak. Mother Devaki is expressing the glories of the Lord and she also understands the Lord, that 
you're the origin of the cosmic creation, you're Brahman, you're the greatest, everything like that. She understands the position of Lord Vishnu, so she can properly glorify him, offer please, pleasing prayers to the Lord. But at the same time, because of her fear, because of her anxiety for the Lord, she wants that the Lord will change his form, right? She doesn't want the Lord to keep that form. One, one reason is, she, she, she says, uh, the forearm form, if she tells people that God came as my child, then they'll think, you know, what kind of woman is this? You know, if a woman comes and says to her other ladies, Oh, I got God as my child. God came as my child. They'll think, oh, she, she's crazy or she's so proud or something like that. They'll find some fault. They won't understand. So the same way Devaki is also worried like that, that if I say that you've come as my child, it won't be appreciated. So she asks the Lord, that, you know, this forearm form, that can you, can you make yourself just like a normal child? Could you just appear as a normal child? It will be better for us. It will be easier for us to explain that the child has been born. So, of course, the Lord is always willing to please the desires of his devotees. So, we hear how the Lord, well first of all, Devaki in her prayers, she talks a lot about time, the element of time, and how time is so powerful. Of course, time is, Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Kalosmin lokakaya skrit pravijo, time I am, destroyer of the world. He, when he showed the Vishwarup to Arjuna, he said, the, he showed him the Kala Rup, the form of time. So Devaki is also speaking a lot about time and she understands how time is also the energy of Lord Krishna. We are under the influence of time, but Lord Krishna is never affected by time. That element of time is controlled by Krishna. Right? What's the verse in the Brahma Samhita? that time is under the control of Krishna? You studied the Brahma Samhita? You know these verses? Yakchak Shuresha. Yes, Yagya Brahmati Samprata Kala Govinda Madhipuri. Yakchak Shuresha Samitasa Kala Grahanam. Raja Samasta Suramurti Rasesha Teja Yash Yagnaya Brahmati Sambharata Kala Chakra Kala Chakra, the wheel of time, right? The sun, king of all planets, the eye of the Lord is mounting the wheel of time. So like that, this is uh, how time is described in the Brahma Samhita and Time is also described in Bhagavad Gita, an, an important one of the elements, the five elements which are discussed in Bhagavad Gita. So everything is under control of time, but Krishna controls. Krishna is not. Krishna is the controller of time. We want to understand properly how to utilize time in the service of the Supreme Lord. Right? You know that verse in the Srimad Bhagavatam, second canto, where they talk about the sun rising and setting. Ah, yes. Go ahead. Ayur Hariti Okay, good. Yeah, just as the sun rising and setting, what, what does it happen? What's the effect of the sun rising and setting? It's going to reduce the duration of life for all people, except who? Devotees. 
Yeah, except those who are hearing the glories of the Lord. If we're hearing the glories of the Lord, then you can remain transcendental to the influence of time. So Devaki describes how even death is running in fear of the Supreme Lord. We are afraid of death, but death personified is afraid of the Supreme Lord. Devaki has wonderful understanding about the nature of the Lord. Devaki, almost like Mother Yashoda, almost on the same level as Mother Yashoda, but they're different, different mood. But she's Nitya Siddha. So she requests the Lord in her prayer. She said, I request you to save us and give us protection from the terrible fear of Kamsa. Your form as Vishnu is appreciated by yogis in Godhead is appreciated by yogis in meditation. Please make this form invisible to those who see with material eyes. And of course, practically it's like that. People who see the Lord with material eyes, they cannot see the Lord. The Lord is not manifest to the foolish and unintelligent. The Lord is covered by yoga maya. But to those who have proper love, then they can see the Lord. So then Devaki continues, she said, in text uh, 29, she said, Please arrange for that sinful kamsa to be unable to understand that you have taken birth from my womb. Devaki is in fear. This is her ecstasy. This is her prema. She's so worried about the Lord. In Vatsalya Ras, the mood of Vatsalya Ras, you want to protect the Lord. The Lord is coming into the child and the devotee thinks, he has to protect. Just like Mother Yashoda, she's always protecting Krishna. Right? You heard Mother Yashoda, she's so worried about Krishna, the demons that will take Krishna, get Krishna. And she's always doing rituals and ceremonies for, to protect Krishna. So Devaki is also very worried about Lord Krishna. She wants to protect him. So she asked him, she said, please, can you just withdraw that form and just become like a natural human child so that I'm, I can hide you somewhere? <laughs> this is Devaki's sweet nature. She doesn't want anything to happen to Krishna. So she asked, let me hide you somewhere. If you just take a normal, but if you have these four arms, if you have this form, you know, four arm form with all these symbols, with all these ornaments and decorations and weapons, how can I hide you? Very difficult. So Devaki said, people will not be able to believe that you have taken birth from my womb. And she said, I'll become an object of ridicule. Well, nobody likes that. And we don't like to be an object. We don't like people laughing at us. That's not very pleasant. So Devaki is also, she has that personal nature. She doesn't want people laughing at her, making a fool of her. Oh, you give birth. What kind of child is this you've given birth to? Vishnu. <laughs> so she wants Krishna to appear with two hands. So she wants him to change his form. So then, when Krishna hears like this, he replies to Devaki, actually, Prabhupada's using Vishnu when he's talking about here. He, he doesn't say Krishna, he said Vishnu. The Personality of Godhead spoke. Uh, he said, uh, O best of the chaste, in your previous birth, right, we, and she, Krishna goes on to, or Vishnu goes on to speak about the previous births. And we know that Vasudeva and Devaki, this was the third birth, right? First of all, they were Prishni and Sutapa. But first of all, as Prishni and Sutapa, in order to get the Lord to Sirtsan, they had to do great austerities. 
they, they were doing very severe austerities. And how long were they doing the austerities for? Anybody know? 10,000 years, perhaps? Yes, I think it was like 10,000 celestial years. It's mentioned about celestial years. And a very long time and very severe, med severe austerities, controlling their senses, eating. What were they eating? Mahapasadam? Dry leaves and air. Rice? Really? Kichiri? No, what were they eating? Dry leaves. Dry leaves. Oh, yeah. Dry leaves. For a thousand, ten thousand years. Of celestial years. In the purport, it said, that's not a very long time for the people of the higher planets. Ten thousand years is not a very long time. But uh, we can understand that it, it was a severe penance. They were very, very determined. They wanted to get this benediction. They wanted the Lord as their child. Not for one birth, but for three births. And in order to achieve that, they really had to make great sacrifices. They endured, it's mentioned, text 34, 35, they endured rain and wind, scorching sun, scorching heat, severe cold, suffering all sorts of inconvenience according to different seasons. And they were, it said, by practicing pranayama to control the air within the body through yoga, and by eating only air and dry leaves fallen from the trees. In this way they cleansed their minds of all dirty things. In this way, desiring a benediction, they worshipped the Supreme Lord with peaceful minds. We cannot be expected to do that kind of austerity. Kali Yuga, we cannot be you know, even for a weekend to do like that. <laughs> Just like today's Bhishma Panchak, right? Are any of you fasting today? Anybody fasting for the Ekadasi today? Yeah, probably nobody, yeah? We don't like austerities very much. So Prabhupada explains what is our austerity. Our austerity is what? What austerity can you do? Chanting of the holy name. Yes, Sankirtan, right? Sankirtan, go out, chant and dance, preach the glories of the holy name. This is the austerity for the Kali Yuga, to go out there and distribute the holy name, distribute books as well if you get the chance. Okay, so Vasudeva and Devaki, they're doing this great austerity and they get the Lord as their son for three births. First, Prishni and Sutapa. Now, Prishni, what is the relationship between Prishni and Sutapa and Vasudeva and Devaki? Do you understand? There's a, there's a special... Can, the, Vasudeva and Devaki, they're the original form. They're the original, they're in their actual position as the mother and father of Lord Krishna. But Prishni and Sutapa, they're like an, they're like an anga of Vasudeva and Devaki. They're not the full Vasudeva and Devaki, but they're an anga, they're part of Vasudeva and Devaki. Part manifestation of Vasudeva and Devaki. And similarly also Kashyapa and Aditi, they're also not equal to Vasudeva and Devaki. Vasudeva and Devaki are the full form of Krishna's mother and father. 
but Prishni and Sutapa, they display also uh, that mood that they want to chuck the Lord as their son. So the Lord comes as their son. And we, we see Vasudev and Devaki also, because they, in, in the form of Prishni and Sutapa, they did all that yoga and meditation. So what's the effect of all that? Does that help you get Krishna Prem? What does it do, all the yoga and meditation? It makes mind peaceful. Mm. That's all. Yeah, it can make the one also hard-hearted. We can become a bit callous. Yeah, we become peaceful. We become more inclined towards knowledge and opulence. We don't have the same mood. Mother Yashoda and Nandama, they don't, they didn't do these kind of things. They're just devote, they're just pure devotion, pure prema bhakti. Vasudev and Devaki is more mixed bhakti. It's more mixed with the desire for knowledge and opulence. So their bhakti is not so pure like Nanda Maharaj and Mother Yashoda, how they are. How they are. So Vasudev and Devaki, they got Krishna as their son. Uh, Oh, yeah, 12,000, it's 12,000 celestial years that Vasudev, uh, Prishni and Sutapa, they did their austerities for 12,000 celestial years. Doing tapasya in consciousness of Krishna, in Krishna consciousness. Now Vasudev and Devaki, they're always Krishna conscious, but this is for the purpose of Leela, they're doing these things like 12,000 celestial years of austerity. Actually, they're eternally Krishna's mother and father. They didn't have to do the sadhana or anything. They didn't have to do the tapasya. But for the pastime and for the teaching, for, so that we can understand the importance of these things, this is why they do it. Anyway, the Lord says how pleased he was with them and how he appeared, he agreed to give them the benediction they wanted, that he would come as their son. They wanted a son like him. There's nobody like him, so he has to come himself, right? He comes as their son and they, and as Prishni and Sutapa, what's the name of the, the child? Prishni and Sutapa's child was? Prishni Karba, right. And Vasudev, and then uh, Kashyapa and Aditi, what's the name of their child? Vamandev. Vamandev, yeah, or Upendra, right. So in this way the Lord is able to fulfill their desires to get the children they want. So it, 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 the Srimad Bhagavatam goes on to describe here about how they controlled their senses. They wanted to have a child. They never desired to be liberated from this material world. Now if you read Srimad Bhagavatam, if you go to 11th canto Srimad Bhagavatam, you can read how Vasudev lamented that he never desired to be liberated. After, after the Lord had finished his pastimes and returned to his eternal abode, 
Then Vasudeva began to think about things and he thought about how he'd been the father of Lord Krishna. And he thought, why he didn't get liberation? He was thinking, why I didn't ask him for liberation? I'm here in the material world. I'm still here in the material world. I should have asked him for liberation. And Prabhupada describes that Vasudev, Vasudev and Devaki, did they get the child, the Lord as their child, very easily? Was it very easy for them to get the Lord as their child? What do you say, Madhiji? Yes, Prabhu, what do you say? Was it easy for, for Vasudev and Devaki to get the Lord as their child? Very difficult, right. But is it difficult for us to go back to Godhead? Yes. Not very difficult. Not very difficult for us to go back to God. What do we need to do to go back to Godhead? Okay. So somebody's going to do Sankirtan. Some, what, some, somebody, you, maybe you've got all the different things. Some, yeah. No, we have to maintain our consciousness. To follow the three things. Number one is chanting, hearing, and reading. This three things, if we follow, then we can go to God. Yet. Oh, okay. So Prabhu, Prabhu here is giving a guarantee. If we do these three things, we can go back to Godhead, right? You're going to take everybody back to Godhead who does these three things, right? You promise, huh? You're going to take, make sure everyone goes back to Godhead if they do these. Yeah, we have to simply engage in Krishna conscious activities. Prabhu said hearing, chanting, reading, okay. We can, the point is, it's very easy to go back to Godhead. Kalir dosha nirde rajan asti ehe kol mahadguna kirtana deva krishna shya mukta sangha parambrajit. Right? The age of Kali is an ocean of faults. But there's one good thing about it. Simply by chanting the holy name, we can get all perfection. So we have to understand from this example here that don't waste your time to get a son like Krishna or to have Krishna as your child. That is the, the important. Some people, they, oh, I also want to get, we should also try and get Krishna as our child. Don't do that. Just simply go back to Godhead and be with Krishna in the spiritual world. We have to understand the real message here. But if we want to go back to Godhead, we have to be niskinchana. We cannot be attached to the material things. We have to be detached. You may be in any ashram. It doesn't matter what ashram you're in. It doesn't matter whether, whether you're a man or a woman. It doesn't matter what is your... We can qualify ourselves to go back to Godhead. So this is important for us. Lord Chaitanya says, we don't want wealth, we don't want followers, we don't want to enjoy the beauty of the opposite sex. We simply want devotional service, birth after birth. So the personality of Godhead is describing to Vasudev and Devaki about what happened, their previous births, how he had been their child already before. And he tells them how you had a desire to have a son like me, you engaged in sex, and I fulfilled your desire. So, that is material life. You want that kind of Vasudev and Deva, they, right? they understood that after the Lord departed. We shouldn't waste our time. We want to transcend these things. Oh, what time is it? Okay, we're doing all right. So, 
the Lord glorifies the character of Vasudev and Devaki. He mentions their qualification. He said, you were very simple. The, the quality of simplicity, a very important quality. Simplicity, meaning not deceitful, straightforward in dealings. Bhagavad Gita also describes Vidya Vinaya Sampani Brahmana, the learned and gentle Brahmana. So simple, that, like that, to be simple in our dealings, not to be materialistic, motivated to exploit others or to get material profit or distinction or anything. Just be simple, just be yourself. So Vasudev and Devaki, they were highly elevated. Their simple mood, their qualities of good character. Yeah, they would have to be in order to sit and meditate for 12,000 years of the demigods to do the austerities which they did. They would have to be very pure in their heart. And therefore the Lord could come as their child. Then in the next millennium, he said, the Lord, uh, he, he comes as Upendra. He comes as a dwarf. And that time also, he's their son. And then the Lord says, I, the same personality, have now appeared of you both as your son for the third time. Take my words as the truth. So the personality of Godhead is telling them the actual facts. They, they may have been surprised that we didn't know, they didn't know this. <laughs> we don't know anything about what we were doing in our previous life. We probably wouldn't like to hear what we were doing in our previous life. We're still here in this material world. So, Jiva Goswami writes about the, in, uh, this situation in his Krishna Sandarbha, and he comments that uh, he comments about the word uh, Amuna Vapusha by the same form. In other words, the Lord told Devaki, "I have appeared in my original form as Sri Krishna." So Lord Krishna, who is appearing in front of Vasudeva and Devaki, Jiva Goswami said, this is the original form of the Lord who appears in front of Vasudeva and Devaki. He said, and he said, I am the same personality, but I appear in full opulence as Sri Krishna. So when the Lord comes as Prishni Garbha, that is not quite the full opulence of the Lord. But in the third birth, when he comes as the child of Vasudeva and Devaki, that time, that is the full personality of Godhead. That is not partial expansion. That is the original personality of Godhead. So Jiva Goswami explains like that, that this is actually the Supreme Lord Himself coming as their child. And then the Lord continues, He said, I've shown you this form just to remind you of my previous births. Otherwise, I would have just been an ordinary child. If I just come as an ordinary child, you wouldn't, be, you wouldn't know that I was God. So I had to convince you. That's why I came. So Devaki knew. Devaki knew, but she was still thinking about other people, worried about the opinions of others, that if others see that her child has four arms, or if others hear that she's given birth to Vishnu, that people will think weird, strange, people won't believe it. 
So this, this is the nature of the devotee. The non-devotees, they cannot understand the forms of the Lord. Non-devotees, they cannot, they will, they, will, they will look at the form of the Lord, just like they look at the deity, they cannot understand, they think it's a statue. They cannot understand. And similarly, when we chant the holy name, they cannot understand that this is transcendental, this is spiritual. Because they're not devotees, they're materialistic, they're covered over by so much ignorance. They cannot understand. But the devotees can understand. Those who have some devotion, who have cultivated devotion, they can understand the position of the Lord. And they will, they will understand also the transcendental nature of devotional activities. So Lord Krishna then reminds Vasudeva and Devaki how they should think of him. He said, think of me constantly with love and affection. Think of me as your son, right? Think, the Lord is telling Vasudeva and Devaki, think of me as your son, but you should always know, what should they know? What should they know? Think of Krishna as their son, but they should always know. He is the supreme, he is supreme personality of Godhead. Right, yes, that He is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And then, in this way, you'll get the perfection, you can go back to Godhead. So, for Mother Yashoda, of course, Mother Yashoda, she only thinks of Krishna as her son. She doesn't think of Krishna as the Personality of Godhead. So, that's another difference between the, the, the dealings between Yashoda and Devaki. For Vasudeva and Devaki, they're thinking of Krishna as God. And that's why they offer prayers. So, to think of the Lord, this is important. We have to know that He is God. We have to know something about His divine qualities, his attributes, and then we can be qualified to go back to Godhead. Mother Yashoda, she thinks of Krishna as her son. She thinks of Krishna because of her very great bhakti, because of her bhava. Actually, that fear of Devaki, that is also a type of bhava. That is actually Vayabhachari Bhakti, Vaya Bhachari Bhava, Vaya Bhachari Bhava, the fear which Devaki had when she was worried about her child being harmed by Kamsa, that was her, due to her, that is a type of Bhava which she is experiencing. There's so much anxiety about how to protect her child. And we see that a woman has a child, a woman who has a child. Uh, I was hearing a story. Uh, in Vrindavan, of course, you have all these big monkeys. You have these monkeys go around, and very de and sometimes the, there was a there was this little girl carrying a banana in her hand, and there were those monkeys. You know, that's a dangerous thing to do in Vrindavan. Have you got monkeys there in Jarakanda, Prabhu? No, no monkeys there. Oh, you're lucky. Anyway. Uh, the, you know, a little girl was carrying a banana in her hand and there were these monkeys, and the, some, some of the monkeys are quite big, they're like Hanuman, you know, they're real, they're real strong looking, you know. And the monkey, when they see a banana, their eyes just light up and the monkey comes, you know, they can go pretty fast. But when the mother saw a little daughter that she was in danger from the monkey, then the mother grabbed a stick and she came running over to, you know, to protect her child. You know, it's an example, that wonderful bhava which is there between the mother and the daughter. And so, 
Devaki, she's also feeling that very great transcendental bhava. Of course, that was a mundane bhava based, based on the, the, the bodily relationship, the mother and her daughter. Devaki's love for Krishna, that's transcendental. But it, it's, it was the same emotion, that mood, vatsalya ras, that va feeling of vatsalya, wanting to give protection to the Lord as their child. So Mother Devaki had that, but at the same time it was mixed. It's mixed with jnana, because she sees the Lord not just as a son, but she sees him as the Supreme Personality of God. Okay, so Prabhupada talks about how sometimes people, they see Krishna as a fictitious person. You know, we talk about Lord Krishna and we will, we will glorify him as devotees, but there are other people that think, oh, this is just a story. They, they may read Krishna book and they may think, oh, nice stories. They don't actually, un they don't read the book closely. They simply may look at the pictures and think nice stories. They don't actually understand the, the real philosophy behind the pastimes of Lord Krishna. And they think when Krishna comes, he's just an ordinary, he's just a figure. They think he's something out of a, a fairy tale or a story. So it's fictitious not real, fiction, right? There's fiction, which is not real, just imagination, imaginated stories. So they think Krishna's like that, he's a fictitious character. So when they hear about Lord Krishna taking birth and doing all these different things, oh, it's just fiction. You know, how could a little child pick up the hill? How could they dance with so many thousands of women in rasa dance. They cannot understand. To them it's just fiction. We have to, that's why we have to educate people very carefully. So this tenth canto is like the face of the Lord. Looking on the face of the Lord, we have to be qualified. Qualification, we've already studied the lower parts of the body of the Lord. We've progressively come to the face. We don't just jump up to the tenth canto, but we see the Lord fr from his lotus feet and then progressively work up. As you've been doing, studying Srimad Bhagavatam through the different cantos to come to this tenth canto, which is the, the shining face of the Lord. So we have to understand how the Lord is not just some fictitious character, but he's actually the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Here in the prison house in Mathura, Vasudev is going to take him out of the house. They're going to take him out of the prison of Kamsa by the potency of Yoga Maya all the chains and shackles and the doors are all going to be unlocked and everyone's going to go to sleep and Vasudev will take the child which Mother Devaki has delivered, who transforms himself into a normal small child and Vasudev will carry him across the Yamuna to Gokul, to the home of Nanda Maharaj. So, it's described that when they were crossing the Yamuna, it was a stormy night. Usually it rains on Janmastami. Usually we see that. It's a rainy season, right? Janmastami, rainy season. It's always risky to do a Janmastami program outside because you never know if it's going to rain. So it was a stormy night and Vasudev has to... But the Yamuna gave way for Vasudev to cross. Different explanations are there. Another explanation is there, describes that uh, a jackal led Vasudev. There was a female jackal who walked across the Yamuna. 
And in this way Vasudev was able, you know, jackals are not very big creatures, they're quite small. So Vasudev saw this jackal cross the Yamuna and he could follow behind the jackal. In this way he could go across the Yamuna. In the, in the Bhagavatam, which we're reading, it's described that uh, just as the Lord Rama crossed the ocean to Lanka, in the same way the Yamuna gave way for Lord Krishna to for, for the form of Lord Krishna to come across the Yamuna, for Vasudeva to carry Krishna to the home of Mother Yashoda. It's also mentioned that Ananta Shesh comes to protect him because it's a stormy night, heavy rain. And so Lord Ananta Shesha, one of his services for the Lord is the umbrella. And he comes to give shelter from the Lord, for the Lord, from all the rain. So Nanda uh, Vasudeva brings the child into the home of Nanda Maharaj and in the home of Nanda Maharaj, Mother Yashoda has already delivered. And Vasudeva comes into the home, everyone is asleep there also. Mother Yashoda is asleep being tired from the labor of delivering child. And so Vasudeva does not say anything, but he simply exchanges the child. He takes the female child, which Mother Yashoda has delivered. Now it's pointed out that in different, in the Harivamsa, Harivamsa is an important scripture. Harivamsa is an ancient scripture. And it describes that at the time of Vasudeva, at the time of Devaki delivering Lord Krishna, at that same time, at the exact same time, Mother Yashoda was also delivering a child, a son, at the same time. And after she delivered the son, then Mother Yashoda delivered a daughter. How do we know that? Because it's mentioned in elsewhere that it mentions that uh, the younger sister of Lord Krishna, Yoga Maya, is described as the younger sister of Lord Krishna. So it was that younger sister, Yoga Maya, who was taken by Vasudeva. And Vasudeva brings her back over to Mathura, to the prison house of Kamsa. And miraculously, he's able to enter into the prison and he puts all the chains and shackles on himself and he sits down with this child, with this girl, the female child, Yoga Maya, which he had taken from Mother Yashoda. So Mother Yashoda, she didn't know. She was fast asleep. Nanda Maharaj also didn't. Nobody was aware. Everyone was asleep. What do you think of that? Vasudev is taking the female child. Now he knows that Kamsa wants to kill the eighth child of Vasudev and Devaki. And here is Vasudev taking the, the child of Nanda Maharaj and he's bringing that child over to Kamsa's prison house. In other words, he wants Kamsa to kill that child instead of his own child. Is that fair? What kind of behavior is that? Do you think that's proper? We have, I was saying Vasudev was a noble, a good character, a noble person, very simple and straightforward. But we hear he's exchanging his child. He wants to protect his child and he's bringing the, the, the child of Yashoda and Nanda Maharaj over to Mathura for Kamsa to kill. Is that proper? Could you explain? Any, anybody like to explain this for us? Why would Vasudev do like this? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Uh, Maharaj, it is written here, Vishwana Chakravati Chakul clear, clarifies this here that Vasudev cannot be accused of callousness since his actions were impelled by the force of Yogamaya. Okay. 
Can you explain a bit more for us in your own words? Yes, Prabhuji. It, it, is, it is basically Lord's plan. So he is just, uh, um, um, he's just following that. He's following the inspiration of the heart. Yeah. You could say the inspiration of the heart, is it? Due to the yes. heart's inspiration. He's under the control of the Supreme Lord. And the, his yes. heart directed him in this way. How did you, what was it say again? Read that section again, which you read. Srila Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur says that one cannot be blamed for protecting one's own child at the sacrifice of one another's. But Vasudev cannot be accused of all callousness since his actions were impelled by the force of Yoga Maya. His actions were impelled by the force of Yoga Maya. And at the same time also, it's natural one will want to protect one's own child. That is definitely the fact. We would want to protect our own child, even at the risk of sacrificing another person's child. <laughs> it's very, very special situation, certainly. Very unique situation. But that kind of thing does happen. Certainly our own family members will be more dear to us than anything. We would want to do everything we could to save them. Of course, we could say, well, maybe Vasudev was thinking, well, this is a girl, maybe Kamsa won't kill a girl. You could think like that. And that's one of the arguments which they give when Kamsa comes. That they tell them, you know, this is a girl, you know, she's not going to do you any harm. <laughs> of course. Kamsa is so cruel, doesn't care. But uh, gen the, the point is, well, you say the, the inspiration of the, the direction of the Lord, the Yoga Maya, that Vasudeva is doing all of this under the direction of the Supreme Lord. And uh, it's not that he is callous, it's not that he is hard hearted or only thinking about his own family. He's a great soul. But <laughs> this is a leela, this is a pastime. So he takes the child and he brings it back to Mathura. And in the prison. All right, so. Uh, I did want to speak about one other, other thing which is discussed there, and that was about three different kinds of bhakti, right? It's mentioned about three different kinds of bhakti are described. Uh, that comes up in text, uh, is it? 28? Oh, no, no, not 28. Uh, 31. 31, right. Yeah, takes 31. Three different kinds of bhakti you should be familiar with, right? There's guna bhuti, pradana bhuti, and kevala. And it's Described here how from Gunabhuti Bhakti knowledge, jnana comes. But that jnana, what's it general happens to what generally happens to people who cultivate jnana? Where do they go? The jnana is the Brahman, right? This is, so that's what happens. They go they get to the Brahman. And for those who are cultivating the pradana bhuti bhakti, then they get they they come to jnanamayi rati. They get jnanamayi rati, and this jnanamayi rati, this leads to knowledge of the Lord, 
but in majesty. That they know God, but they know Him in opulence, in His majesty. As opposed to sweetness, they know the Lord in majesty. That's the result of Jnana Mai Rati, that you'll know the Lord in majesty. But if we cultivate Kevala Bhakti, from Kevala Bhakti, then we can come to Prema. And we can understand everything about the Lord in Prema. So, of course, as devotees, we want to cultivate Prema. We want to come to Prem. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, Prema Mahat, Prema. Prem Mahato Mabha, Prem Mahato Prem Mahato Mabha, what is it, the goal of life is Prem. Prem Kumartu Mahan. Prem Kumartu, Prem Kumartu, Prem Kumartu Mahan, right, Prem Kumartu Mahan. The goal of life is to develop Prem. So Krishna, pre but we have to cultivate this Kevala Bhakti. Kevala bhakti, pure bhakti, not mixed bhakti. Anya vilasita sunyam, jnana karma janavritam, anoko yena krishna no shilanam bhakti uttamam. Right, that Rupa Goswami told us what is pure bhakti? No desires for jnana, no desires for liberation, no desires for fruit of gain. We simply want to serve Krishna as Krishna desires. So this is Kevala Bhakti and do Kevala Bhakti, then we will come to Prem. And with Prema Bhakti, we can appreciate the Lord in His sweetness. So the, sweet, the sweetness, not just Aishwarya, not majesty, as in Jnana Mairati, but in sweetness. The nature of Vrindavan Leela is sweetness. Dwarka is more Aishwarya, but Vrindavan is sweetness. And there are different aspects of the Lord which are sweet. Just like the, the Lord's, about the Lord is very sweet. And also the Lord's uh, association with devotees is very sweet. And the Lord's powers are also very sweet to the devotee. And in Vrindavan, when the Lord plays the flute, that is very sweet. We think about the Lord's sweetness, particularly in relation to his, uh, his flute playing. We know four opulences which are unique to the Lord, right? There's Venu Madhurya, then Rupa Madhurya, the form of the Lord, Lila Madhurya, the pastimes of the Lord, and what's the fourth one? Rupa Madhurya? No, I said Rupa Madhurya. Rupa Madhurya, Lila Madhurya, Venu Madhurya, and one more. Prema Madhurya. Prema Madhurya, yes, in the association of the devotees. There's Prem. We get love. So these are all different aspects, the sweetness of the Lord. We want to appreciate this. So Mother Yashoda, she experiences this kind of sweetness. She's on that platform. Mm. We, uh, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, he discusses what's greater, Prema or Maya? <laughs> Is Prema greater or Maya greater? So, of course, we will say, well, definitely, Maya is very powerful, it's Krishna's energy. But, Prema conquers Krishna. We say, Prem Punarto Mahan, right? Prema con Krishna is a, a, a jita, is unconquerable. But, 
He's conquered. Who is he conquered by? Who conquers Krishna? His devotees love. Yes, the devotee, one who stays and hears about him with love and the association of devotees, then he conquers Krishna, although Krishna is unconquerable. There's that nice verse in the tenth canto spoken by Lord Brahma. Stanestita shruti gatan van manobir ye prayaso jita jitopi asitai strilokyam. Right? The, Krishna is ajita, but he becomes he becomes conquered by those who love him. So if you have that love, if you have that real devotion, that prem, then you conquer Krishna. So does Maya ever conquer Krishna? No, Maya never conquers Krishna. Krishna is conquered by pure loving devotion. Bhakti mama vijanati. Krishna wants the bhakti, but the, Maya is Krishna's energy, so Krishna doesn't have to fear Maya. Okay, we'll, we'll ask, is there any questions? Anybody has any questions? I answered all your questions, huh? Okay, and if there are no questions, then we'll meet tomorrow. We have to go on. If you, if you read over the chapter more and you have questions, then bring them tomorrow. Try not to keep all your questions for the last day. <laughs> it's what usually happens. On the last day, every, so many questions. So try to have the questions as we go on. Jalangi, any questions? No question, Guru Maharaj. Thank you. Okay. So I'll see you tomorrow. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Hey. Go back to Vrinda Ki.